What would you do if you came face to face with one of the greatest evils the world has ever known? Would you have the nerve to confront mass murders on their own turf? Raul Wallenberg's story shows that one person can make a difference, even when facing what seems like impossible odds. Wallenberg's story is close to my heart because of my own family history. People often ask, who was Raul Wallenberg? Why do we celebrate him? He was not Canadian, nor did he serve Canada. Wallenberg was a Swedish businessman and diplomat during World War II. Sweden was a neutral country. And yet, Wallenberg's story affects us all. In 1985, Brian Mulroney's government declared Raul Wallenberg Canada's first honorary citizen in recognition of his humanitarian efforts. This is his story. This is a picture of young Raul with his grandfather, Gustav Wallenberg. Raul Wallenberg's father died just before Raul was born in 1912. Gustav Wallenberg had been Swedish ambassador to Japan in the early 1900s. He helped smooth out a diplomatic spat that Japan had with Great Britain and the United States. The Japanese were very impressed with Gustav Wallenberg. Sweden became one of Japan's largest trading partners for many decades after. These are Raul Wallenberg's uncles, Jacob and Marcus Wallenberg. They ran Sweden's largest bank, the SEB, Stockholm's Enschede Banken. In Sweden, the Wallenbergs were comparable to the U.S. Rockefeller family. But Raul Wallenberg was not automatically accepted into the family fold. This is a picture of Raul as a schoolboy. Gustav Wallenberg sponsored Raul's education. He wanted him to be a citizen of the world. By the time he was done school, Raul spoke five languages, Swedish, German, French, English, and Russian. He was also an excellent actor. Raul studied architecture at the University of Michigan. He traveled extensively about the United States and Mexico. He often traveled by hitchhiking. It was a good way to get to know the locals. He also made it to Vancouver and Northern Ontario. He may even have gone through Aurelia. He liked Canadians, he found them very friendly and down to earth. After Michigan, Raul worked for a trading company in South Africa, and then for a bank in Haifa, Palestine. There in 1937, he first met Jews displaced by Germany's Nuremberg laws. This is a picture of the Mid-European Trading Company in Stockholm. Wallenberg worked for a Hungarian Jew by the name of Kalman Lauer. Kalman Lauer had a food import-export business between Sweden and Budapest, Hungary. So Raul traveled to Hungary several times through Germany. He learned Hungarian, but he also learned how to deal with Nazis. The world's worst fears about the Nazis were confirmed in April 1944. Two escaped Slovak Jews published the Auschwitz papers. This was confirmation that extermination of European Jews had been expanded to an industrial level. This is a picture of Budapest, Hungary. In early 1944, it was mostly untouched by the war. On March 19, 1944, Hungary was occupied by Germany after the regent Nicholas Horthy tried to make peace with the West. This is a picture of Adolf Eichmann, chief overseer of the Final Solution. He arrived in Budapest shortly after the German takeover. He started plans to exterminate Hungary's 800,000 Jews. The American government decided to try to stop them. Sweden had already taken in Norwegian and Danish Jews. 
So the American War Refugee Board sent a representative, Eva Olson, to Stockholm in June 1944. Ever Olsen was the representative. He met with Colin Lauer, who recommended Raul Wallenberg. At first, Wallenberg was thought too young. He was only 32 years old, with no diplomatic experience. But Kalman Lauer persisted. Jews in Hungary were quickly forbidden to work, to own property. All their valuables were taken. Their citizenship was revoked. They had to wear the yellow stars in their clothing. They couldn't even sit on park benches. They were herded into prison camps and brutal ghettos. Deportation of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz started in May 1944. Jews were packed into cattle cars, 80 to 100 per rail car. Each rail car received one bucket of water for the five days travel to the gas chambers. 500,000 Jews were deported in 50 days until the entire countryside was cleared. Only Jews in Budapest remained by July 1st. At the end of June, Wallenberg agreed to go to Budapest with the condition that he not be restricted to the usual diplomatic rules. He would work through the Swedish legation with full diplomatic immunity, in theory. Once in Budapest, Wallenberg's unconventional methods shocked the embassy staff, but they were soon impressed with the results. He got help in the form of funding from the American War Refugee Board. At the same time, the King of Sweden appealed to Horthy to stop the deportations. This worked only temporarily. This is a picture of the Swedish embassy in Budapest in 1944. The Jews can be seen lining up outside. Pat Anger was a career diplomat working there. He had created certificates of immigration, protective letters for the Jews. Only Jews with Swedish connections were eligible, so only 700 of these were issued. Wallenberg worked with Pat Anger to expand on this idea. Wallenberg created the Swedish Schutzpasses. They're an impressive looking temporary passport. Each was signed by Wallenberg and the head of the Swedish legation. The bearer was under protection of Sweden. They're forbidden to be deported, harassed, or have their possessions confiscated. And it gave authority to remove the yellow star from their clothing. Wallenberg got permission from Horthy to issue 5,000 of these initially, but unofficially 20,000 were issued over time. This is a picture of Wallenberg with his staff. He hired a large organization, 300 people, mostly Jews. They administered the passes, bought apartment buildings, arranged medical care and food and kitchens for all the Jews in the buildings. Wallenberg used his connections in the food import business to secure shipments of food. He used his connections in the banking business to get funds transferred to Budapest. With his previous skills, he was the right person in the right place at the right time. Wallenberg created safe houses. After a while, the Schutz passes were not enough. He had to up the ante almost every day to keep the Jews safe. He used his architectural know-how to put 35,000 people in buildings designed for 5,000. It was like looking after all the needs of a population bigger than Aurelia. He put up Swedish flags on the safe houses and declared them Swedish territory. Much of what Wallenberg did was illegal by international law, but stripping people of their rights and shipping them off for extermination was also illegal, so Wallenberg constantly had to invent countermeasures. So where did Wallenberg get the idea of declaring buildings Swedish territory? There was a Canadian precedent from January 19, 1943. It 
It was widely believed that the Ottawa Civic Hospital Maternity Ward was declared Dutch for Queen Juliana when she gave birth to Princess Marguerite. The heir to the Dutch throne couldn't be born in Canada. Actually, the Canadian Parliament only declared it extraterritorial, which means not part of Canada. They had no authority to declare anything Dutch. The Nazis and the Hungarian Nazi Aero Cross were not diplomats. They didn't know the proper diplomatic protocols. This is a picture of Karl Lutz of the Swiss legation in Budapest. Uh, Rall spoke to Karl Lutz almost daily to coordinate actions and resources. The Swiss had more people than Sweden under their protection, about 30,000 passes and about 50,000 people in their safe houses. Wallenberg worked closely with several other locations, Spain, Portugal, the Red Cross, the Papal Nuncio, as well as the Jewish underground. Wallenberg was often the driving force around negotiations and organization of resources. His force of character was a big inspiration to others. Wallenberg's methods were not passive. He confronted Nazis who were trying to deport the Jews. He was a very skilled negotiator and actor. He was actually a very warm person, but often uses acting skills to transform himself. He could be as frightening as a Gestapo officer and would bribe or threaten to get his way. He did not use guns, only his wits and courage. When the deportation trains were to leave, Pat Anger and Raul Wallenberg would arrive at the railway station and Raul would demand that his Jews leave with him. There was much bluffing and deception. They would accept driver's licenses, vaccination records, tax receipts, any Hungarian documents that the Germans didn't understand. Pat Unger would slip passes to the Jews while the guards were distracted. The upper left picture shows Wallenberg negotiating for the release of Jews at the station. He's the one with his hands clasped behind his back. 500 Jews were saved on this day alone. In the second picture, they are seen walking back to the safe houses. This next picture is fuzzy for a reason. Wallenberg's personal photographer could have been shot if the camera had been seen, so it was hidden behind a thin scarf. Adolf Eichmann tried to have Raul Wallenberg killed several times. One day, a German army truck ran into Wallenberg's car and crushed the passenger compartment. The driver was slightly injured, but Wallenberg was not in the car. Wallenberg phoned Eichmann and said to him, Nice try, Eichmann, but unfortunately I was not in my car today when your driver ran into it. Better luck next time. Wallenberg would have Eichmann over for dinner so he could argue with him. Pat Anger said even though they argued intensely, Eichmann could not conceal that he was impressed by Wallenberg. Wallenberg had to move around in secret, but had a knack to be in the right place at the right time. His large organization helped to keep him informed. His reputation became almost mythical. Once he saved 200 Jewish laborers just by showing up because the young Aerocross guards left in a panic when they heard Wallenberg was coming. Late in the fall, the deportations had stopped. Himmler had ordered the gas chambers destroyed in early November 1944. The Cross attacked the Swedish legation and started executing Jews. All the Swedish legation members had to go underground to avoid attack. This is a picture of the Shoe Memorial on the shore of the Danube. The Arrow Cross would seize Jews and take them here on cold December nights. The Jews were ordered to remove their clothes and then tied together in threes. They were then lined up on the riverbank and ordered to remove their shoes. 
the middle person in the group would be shot. All three would fall into the river and drown. Only the shoes were left. Wallenberg would get together some helpers, and they would wait some distance downstream and rescue many. This is a picture of Himmler and General Schmidhuber. Schmidhuber is the person on the right foreground in the picture. Adolf Eichmann left Budapest before the Russians arrived, but left instructions for Schmidhuber to blow up all the Jewish ghettos. Wallenberg found out and immediately sent Schmidt Huber a message. If you do this, you will be tried for war crimes and you will hang. Schmidt Huber was unnerved. The tanks were withdrawn and 100,000 Jews were saved on that day. This happened on January 16, 1945. This is the last picture the world has of Raoul Wallenberg. He went to meet the Soviets on January 17, 1945, to advocate for the Jews. As he had done many times before, Pat Anger warned him to be careful. Wallenberg's last words to Pat Anger were, to me, there's no other choice. Wallenberg was never seen again. This is a picture of Lubyanka prison in Moscow. Wallenberg was imprisoned here. To the Russians, it was incomprehensible that someone in Wallenberg's situation would come to Budapest to rescue Jews. Wallenberg was arrested as a spy and for collaborating with the Germans. First, the Russians claimed he was a guest of the Soviet Union. Then the Hungarian news reported him killed. Sweden didn't know what had happened. Had the Soviets released him? As a result, Sweden made no serious attempts to negotiate for Wallenberg's release. By 1947, the Soviets claimed to have no knowledge of Wallenberg. Years later, they claimed he died in prison in July 1947. To this day, Wallenberg's fate is a mystery. This is my father, Nils Kalin. I want to talk about him. His story is related to Wallenberg's. My father also did humanitarian work through another Swedish embassy during the war. My father was born in Gothenburg, Sweden in 1906, so he's six years older than Wallenberg. He was educated in Germany and England, and then got his business degree from the University of Gothenburg. He started at SKF in 1928, the Swedish ball bearing manufacturer. The Wallenbergs were the largest shareholders. Jacob Wallenberg was chairman of the board. My father was sent to SKF Schweinfurt, Germany to help that facility in 1929. This is the entrance to the SKF Schweinfurt plant in 1932. The Nazi presence in industries in Germany started in 1931. By 1932, all business meetings started with the Heil Hitler salute. My father refused to do the Hitler salute, and after a while he got pretty uncomfortable, so he asked for a transfer. He was sent instead to SKF Yokohama, in Japan. To his, reduce his social isolation, he volunteered at the Swedish Embassy. He's given the title of Vice Consul and did mostly routine, routine duties. This picture was taken in 1941 in my father's house in Yokohama. It's an interesting picture on several levels. These guys may have been shot details of the picture had been made public. His Japanese friends are mocking the militarists using my father's samurai swords. Most educated Japanese knew that the militarist policy of the government were a recipe for disaster. My father learned Japanese very well, but he also learned Japanese authoritarian mannerisms. These guys are really good at it. December 7th and 8th, 1941,
Pearl Harbor and Hong Kong were attacked almost simultaneously. Many countries withdrew their diplomatic legations from Japan, and Sweden was asked to represent them. The Swedish ambassador delegated these duties. My father became acting ambassador for Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, Greece, Mexico, Chile, and Argentina, nine countries in all. My father also did special duties for the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations. He was asked to inspect the internment camps and prison camps to ensure proper treatment of prisoners. The camps were being run by the Kempitai, the Japanese equivalent to the Gestapo. The level of cruelty in the camps was horrific. The prisoners were being tortured and executed. My father asked for better treatment, and he got laughed at. To the Japanese, this was dishonorable. Prisoners could only maintain their honor by accepting incarceration without complaint. Sometimes he was just handed a shovel and given permission to give the remains a Christian burial. So he had to change his tactics. Like Wallenberg, he was a good actor, so he strutted into the camps like he owned the place and threatened severe consequences if the rules of the Geneva Convention were not followed. Unlike Wallenberg, he went into the camps alone. He had no backup. But his efforts were mostly effective. Many commanders respected the Geneva Convention. My father also brought in medical supplies to keep the prisoners alive. Probably hundreds were saved just by being the world's observing eye. The bombing attack started with a Doolittle raid in April 1942. My father moved into an apartment in the Chilean embassy in Tokyo to be closer for his diplomatic duties. This is a picture of the air raid shelters in Tokyo. They were built in the middle of the street, but they could become like ovens when the build, burning buildings fell on them during the air raids. My father refused to use them. My father would get into the streets when the air raids started and he would run at right angles to the path of bombers to avoid being underneath them when they released their bombs. The fire brigades in Tokyo were totally inadequate, so the residents were trained to stay and fight the fires. This is a picture of a B-29 Super Fortress bomber. On the night of March 9th to 10th, 1949, 1945, 279 Super Fortress bombers each dropped about 3,000 small gasoline bombs on Tokyo. The Americans had waited for dry, windy conditions. As intended, they were successful in creating a huge firestorm from the mostly wood and paper buildings. My father got out of his apartment and he ran and ran for his life. He finally got on top of a hill about 10 kilometers away. But even from that distance, the fire was too hot to look at for more than a few moments. He said the city had been transformed into a sea of white hot flame. This is a picture of the area that was destroyed. It was about 40 square kilometers. Only shells of the stone and brick buildings remained. This was actually the deadliest air raid in history. The official death toll at 120,000 was much higher than Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or Dresden. But oddly, it's mostly unknown to history. Over 1.1 million people lived in the area that was burned out. According to my father, the death toll was grossly underreported. There were probably at least 200,000 dead. The Japanese became hostile to Westerners after the air raid. This is a picture of a Japanese army truck from the time. My father was carrying medicine to one of the prison camps on his motorcycle. An army truck driver driving the opposite way 
saw that it was a westerner on a motorcycle and deliberately swerved his truck. My father's motorcycle struck the truck head on. He flew over the truck and landed on the road behind. He survived by crawling off the road before the next truck could run him over. He had many broken ribs and a mangled right arm. He was taken to a Japanese army doctor who tried to amputate his arm. My father was held down to the operating table by soldiers, but he didn't want his right arm amputated. The incident ended when he punched the doctor. He knocked him out with a left hook, and then he ran. My father decided to travel to Sweden to save his right arm. At this time, there was no civilian travel. He managed to get an exit visa signed from a friend of his who was governor of Yokohama province. After leaving Tokyo, one of his Swiss friends died during an interrogation by the Kempitai. Another friend of his in the Japanese Admiralty office signed a permit to travel to Korea by warship. Three ships left the harbor at Shimonoseki. My father was locked in a cell down in the lower hold and a guard was posted outside the cell. Halfway across, they were attacked by American torpedo bombers. The two ships on either side of my father's ship were struck by torpedoes and sunk. Then my father's ship was struck and the hold and the cell where he was started filling up with water. My father tried to bribe the guard to let him out of the cell, but the guard panicked and left him there and ran up the steps. Somehow they managed to keep the ship afloat, and my father survived again. Eventually, my father arrived in Korea and traveled up through Korea and China to the Trans-Siberian Railway. The Russians were not happy about having a foreign traveler on the Trans-Siberian Railway. The location of Russian war industries in Siberia was a state secret. Two guards were posted to my father and the blinds were drawn in the railway compartment. The guards gave my father vodka and tried to keep him drunk, but my father didn't like vodka. Eventually the guards drank the vodka and sometimes fell asleep, so my father could wander around a bit. He saw trainloads of German POWs being taken east to be worked to death in Siberia. And he saw trains with Russian military, military supplies going west. Suddenly, at a point west of the Ural Mountains, the train came to a stop by a small building. The guards ordered my father off the train. He thought he had probably seen too much and it was time for him to be shot. They led him into the small building. There was one other captive inside, also with two guards. It was Raul Wallenberg. They only had a minute to talk, time to ask if each was okay. Then my father was ordered back on the train. This happened in May 1945 four months after Wallenberg was arrested. My father eventually arrived in St. Petersburg, Leningrad, but there were delays in getting an exit visa to, to leave Russia. He was worried that the same thing would happen to him as what happened to Wallenberg. He met an old Swedish friend in St. Petersburg who was working as a Swedish diplomatic courier. They hatched a plan and went down to the railway station an hour before the train was to leave for Finland. The friend buried my father under a pile of diplomatic mail. The train was searched three times by the NKVD, the Russian secret police, but the diplomatic mail was not touched, so my father managed to make it to Finland buried under that mail. He would probably have been shot if we'd been discovered hiding under the pile of diplomatic mail. After getting back to Sweden, my father was asked to keep quiet about meeting Wallenberg by the Swedish Foreign Office. 
they probably did not believe his account. Around the same time, there were reports of Wallenberg being seen in Budapest. My father never told anyone about meeting Wallenberg until I interviewed him in 2001. For his actions in Japan, my father was awarded the Order of Vasa by the King of Sweden and the Order of St. Olaf by the King of Norway. Both are knighthoods. As a family, we arrived in Canada, Canada in 1957. So how did Raul Wallenberg become famous? Before 1980, he was only well known in Sweden. This is a picture of Annette and Tom Lantos. Both had been rescued by Wallenberg in Budapest. Years after the war, prisoners were being released from the Russian prisoners, and the reports of Raul Wallenberg being sighted in the Soviet Gulag in the late 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and even the 1970s. Annette wanted to do something to get the American government to act. She got articles on Wallenberg published in the New York Times and the Washington Post in 1980. Tom Lantos had been an errand boy for Wallenberg in Budapest. Also, he was the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the U.S. Congress. Tom Lantos sponsored a bill to make Raul Wallenberg an honorary U.S. citizen. In 1981, Ronald Reagan passed a bill, and Raul Wallenberg became America's second honorary citizen after Winston Churchill. There are many Raul Wallenberg memorials, organs, organizations, and awards around the world. The Manhattan Memorial features cobblestones from the Budapest Jewish ghetto and granite pillars from Sweden. A brass briefcase represents Wallenberg, Raul Wallenberg's unfinished business. This memorial is across the street from the United Nations building. The flagpoles on the right-hand side of the picture are the flagpoles at the front of the UN building. The Toronto Memorial is on Royal Wallenberg Road in Earl Bales Park in North York. It's next to Bravery Square, which is the Toronto Holocaust Memorial. This is a picture of Eva and Leslie Meisels. They're both Hungarian Holocaust survivors. Eva and I did a Holocaust Education Week talk together in 2013. She was saved by Raul Wallenberg on two occasions. First at the train station, she and her mom were pulled off the train by Raul Wallenberg just before it was to leave the station because they had the Swedish Schutz passes. On another occasion, she saw the tanks gather outside the building. They were just getting ready to fire on the building when all of a sudden they packed up and left for no apparent reason. Leslie was a survivor of the Bergen-Belsen death train. Today there are many thousands of Wallenberg Jews and their descendants in Canada. This is a picture of Pat Unger later in life. When researching this project, I got a big surprise, which makes this story even closer to me personally. I was watching a videotape in interview of Pat Anger and realized I knew him. So why did I know this guy? I did a bit of research and found that he had been Swedish ambassador to Canada from 1963 to 65. My father was Swedish Consul General in Toronto at that time. The Swedish ambassador would often come for dinners or diplomatic functions. As a young boy, I was assigned the duty of doorman, so I remember greeting Pat Anger at our front door on several occasions. Raul Wallenberg was able to save more Jews than any other government or organization and yet, in a cruel irony, the world was unable to save him. 
Over the years, all inquiries with the Russians ended with the same response. He died in 1947. It is said that Wallenberg didn't just save 100,000 Jews, but he restored our faith in humanity. He has become an international symbol against all types of human rights abuses and injustices. In addition to being declared Canada's first honorary citizen, January 17th was declared Canada's Raw Wallenberg Day by Jean Chrétien's government in 2001. Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations and Nobel Peace Laureate said, Wallenberg is an important figure for us all, not least today when intolerance is once again casting its long shadow across the world. In 2013, Julia Gillard's government declared Wall Wallenberg Australia's first honorary citizen. At the induction ceremony, it was said, by honoring Wall Wallenberg with Australian citizenship, we are not only paying tribute to him, to what he achieved, and to what he stood for, but we're also making a statement about who we are as a nation. One person can make a difference. Thank you for taking the time to hear his story. <laughs>